Hello, JJ. It's uh, very nice to meet you, and uh, congratulations on uh, winning the Piano Hero Contest. Thank you, Mr. Jalbert. So, uh, what will you be playing uh, for me today? I'll be playing Haydn Sonata, Hob XVI, Op. 49, and Liz Knarmring. All right, great. I look forward to hearing you whenever you want. I'll just take a seat.
bravo. I would like to applaud, but I'm alone, so it would sound strange. Uh, that sounds terrific, you know. Um, it, it's, it's, of course, amazingly impressive that uh, not only you play it so well, but you play it so well at the incredible age of 11 years old, um, and, and that you play so many other things so well. I, I thought that since you play Chopin wonderfully, I, I would perhaps teach you in Haydn and find a few more faults to your playing, but I'm still looking, you know. <laughs> I, think, uh, uh, I think it's really terrific. You like this piece? Yes, it's a very nice piece. Yeah, it's very nice. What do you like about it? Well, it's very joyful, mm -hmm. and there's lots of colors, and lots of passages, which sounds nice when you play them good. Yes, it does. Uh, it sounds very nice when you play them, uh, for sure. So tell me, is it the first Haydn that you've played? No, I played one more Haydn sonata before. Okay. It was um, the the. Oh yeah, the D major, that one. That's also a fun one. Um, so, uh, do you know where Haydn was from? Um, uh, he went to. Um, where he was like where he was born. Yeah, or where he lived uh, most of his life. In Europe. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely true. He lived in Europe. Uh, he was from Austria, so uh, he spent most of his life in uh, Vienna. Uh, and Vienna, of course, has a very, very strong uh, musical culture, right? It's, uh, it's where Mozart spent uh, a lot of his career. I mean, it was the, the sort of mecca of, uh, uh, of where he would get his works created. Uh, you know, it was the center of, of uh, musical Europe at that time. Uh, so Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven all had uh, kind of the heart of their careers there. So there's a very strong Viennese tradition. And um, of course, you can add Schubert to that a little later, and then, uh, and then Mahler and Strauss. Uh, so it's a very strong musical city with uh, its own style and its own history. And, and there's something to the Viennese style that uh, perhaps we can talk about a little bit since everything else is so good uh, in your playing. Um, they have a strong uh, sense of, uh, of rhythm, and you have very, very good rhythm, uh, but they, they tend to make the rhythm dance in their own special way, you know, their own Viennese way. And, and later on in history, you can really hear that in, in Strauss waltzes. I'm sure you've heard uh, a few Strauss uh, waltzes, you know, like the Blue Danube or uh, Wiener Blut, uh, <laughs> you know, these, these kind of classics of, um, of the Viennese style. Um, but even earlier on in Haydn's time, there's a certain distribution of the rhythm that, uh, that you can play with to add a little, uh, a little flair to the way you play this piece. Um, and it usually has to do with uh, putting the shorter notes together and spreading out the long notes. So it creates a sort of slinky effect if you do it right. Um, and I've never played this, so I'm sure to make a fool of myself. Uh, I find the tempo a little fast. I think that, um, that a slightly more controlled tempo um, would allow you to do more in, uh, with regards to what I'm about to talk to you about. Um, because, you know, see, he writes these slurs that go... Right? And, and at the tempo that you play it at, it's not terribly possible to uh, bring these out, right? You know, because it's so fast and it's very clear what you do. Um, but there's, uh, there's little hints in the writing to me that it should be a little slower. Um, for instance, at the end when you have these uh, funny, right? Uh, at the tempo that you play it at, it's, it's kind of hard to make this work, right? Uh, uh, if you're going, uh, we don't fully appreciate the tease of this uh, little grace note, right? So um, it would be a little more difficult to play it a little more held back because everything is more clear and open, but then you can do more also with the music. So back to this rhythm thing. <laughs> I'll squeeze the third beat onto the first beat, right? Mm. 
it's like um, the phrases go like this, if you can see. Um, so you create the little space before the next third beat, right? And, So it's, it's just got a little more lilt, right? A little more swing. Uh, do you want to try? It's really prodigious. <laughs> you know, I've explained this concept to 20 year old students, and uh, it takes them weeks to get their heads around it. And you do it at first try. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I was talking about. It's terrific. How do you like it? I mean, do you see what it, uh, what it brings to the piece, you know? Uh, and that's really in the character of, of Haydn. Uh, I think it's got a little more humor, a little more. Uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, aspect to it. Um, so let's take it from there and keep going. Um, play the opening again and we'll get to the second. <laughs> So uh, while you squeeze the 16ths together, the danger, of course, is to have them be just a little too uh, close together. You still want to keep that beautiful clarity that you have. And, and you do most of the time. So that was uh, mostly super. Um, when, you, when you get to this uh, different phrase, it, it, It's, it's very good, and you do a very good crescendo to the top of the line, uh, to do it here, you know. But I think um, in the middle of it, in the middle of the line, there's kind of peaks and valleys rather than a long, steady climb to the top. And um, at the risk of being more predictable, I think that you should try to stay piano longer in this and then to have really one line climbing. And listen to your sound, enjoy it, you know? And, and going a little slower will allow for this to be a little more contrasting from the first theme, right? Sorry, it's terrible. Hmm. I think it's great that you uh, uh, articulate this uh, last eighth note to each bar the way that you do. I think that in this case, you could make it a little less staccato if we try to give it a more um, a legato character for the long line while still detaching it from the downbeat. Uh, it doesn't need to be so short, uh, just so it sounds a little more lyrical, you know? Um, not, not exactly like this. I mean, still detached, but not... That's it. <laughs> See, technically, it, po it poses a problem because you're, uh, you're used to doing it very short and bouncing off it to the next note. But um, I'm okay. You know, just uh, like it's a, a tenuto and not a staccato, right? Okay, take your time. Make a 
just wait for it. Wonderful. That's a beautiful tempo I find. That's really wonderful. What do you think of the tempo? I think it's better. Yeah, it is better. Um, and, and it sounds more like Haydn because you, the virtuosity that you have, um, it, it just wasn't around at the time, you know? Um, because uh, when Haydn wrote this, uh, no one was playing Liszt Etudes and, and Chopin concertos and ballads. You know, it, it wasn't around uh, this kind of big repertoire to make people have super, super fast fingers and, and, and work in that way, you know? So, uh, so when we play this with our modern technique, we tend to change uh, the conception a little bit because we're so, we're so good now. <laughs> you know, but at the time, they, of course, had very, very different instruments, right? Uh, this was the very, very, very beginning of the pianoforte, right? I mean, Haydn grew up on harpsichords, uh, tiny instruments, and the late sonatas, like this one, um, were really made to showcase this new instrument that the pianoforte is. Have you ever played on the pianoforte, a sort of... Uh, uh, one of the early, early pianofortes. No, not yet. It's very, very different. You know, in terms of feel, it's sort of closer to a harpsichord than, than to a piano. First, the keyboard is much smaller, of course. There's no pedal uh, like the pedals that we know it, at least at first. Um, eventually, they have four pedals. Uh, there are two different kinds of soft pedals. Uh, um, but uh, that's later on. The first ones only for, uh, in terms of pedal, they only have a thing that you can push with your knee, with the top of your knee. That was all that there was for a pedal at the time. And, and, and the sound of the instrument is a lot softer. Of course, it's not as powerful, right? Um, and the action is a lot, lot lighter. So it's a completely, completely different world. And um, if we go on those pianos and try to play with our fast fingers, actually it's super hard to control because it tends to run on us because there's just no resistance. Uh, technically, it's very special. Uh, you should try it someday uh, if you get a chance. So I think with this kind of articulation where we hear every 16th note, right? At this slightly more controlled tempo, you can show more of the music and, and it's more elegant and it's more Viennese and um, it sounds more like, uh, like Haydn, you know? Um, I was just going to say, perhaps this D in the bass, um, you tend to make it a little too short, I find. Uh, you do this one beautifully, try to do this one the same. Do you mind trying from here? Actually, too soon. Um, uh, you know, tom, pim, two, three, one, two, pim, 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 pim. So that's what he writes, and I would say longer than that, right? Try to create a suspense. Uh, w means wait. <laughs> so um, try to make it uh, a real surprise. Um, <clears throat> He makes us wait. We're supposed to go to here, right? But the whole time we're just an A flat major. It's completely <laughs> surprising. Haydn was known for his sense of humor, you know, and uh, the Surprise Symphony is, is, is one of his famous uh, pieces where it starts all soft and all of a sudden there's a big boom in the orchestra, you know. This is similar. Um, he, we're, we're all the time expecting that he will conclude the exposition and get here. And there is this long, long passage to make us wait. So make it funny, right? Try just from here.
Good. This beautiful passage, right, with the counterpoint, is very, it's very Mozart, <laughs> actually, the way he writes this passage. Um, so try to sustain the soprano. You see how he's uh, here jumping, and and since you're singing the left hand beautifully, you kind of stop paying attention to the right hand here. And another thing, you you your end of passage dynamic, you put here, right. Um, I think it should be here. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's it's kind of, it's, it, it's finished here, and then you just embroider around it. I think you should sustain the dynamic a little longer so that it dies only here. Want to try? You get it so well, uh, this Viennese idea of, of squeezing the eight notes together. That's a perfect example there, right? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Because, you know, in the score, we see that this is N3, N1, N3, N1. But this is just the conventions that we have to organize in order to write music down, right? The music itself, when Haydn thinks of this, uh, is not N3, N1. It's Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum, bum. It's really one, two, three, four in a way. One, two, three, four. And now you did it perfectly, I thought. You know, you want to stretch the rest in between. T, 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 slightly. Bum, 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 bum. And then, of course, Beethoven quotes this famously. Do you know the Appassionata Sonata? Yes. Yes. Well, P, 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 P. Bum, 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 yeah, 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 and then it explodes, you know. Uh, but it's it's the exact same notes actually. What uh, Beethoven does uh, these ones, uh, this passage. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's texto. I mean, it finds itself in the Appassionata first movement uh, exactly. So, of course, Haydn was a teacher of uh, of Beethoven. You know that, uh, and of uh, and of Mozart. You've probably heard that. Uh, <laughs> that old joke, uh, why, why couldn't uh, Mozart find his teacher? Because <laughs> he was hiding. Uh, <laughs> hiding, hiding. I know it's terrible. Don't put that in the video. <laughs> but everyone has to hear this joke at one point. It's, if you're a pianist, you can't avoid it. Uh, so here, um, I think you work too hard for the Sforzandos. Um, you're, you're really phrasing it well, you know, three, one, two, three, one, two. But um, I think your cut is a little rough. Um, I think you can play it more beautifully. Um, Sorry, I don't know the notes. Um, you know, a little more legato, I think uh, the cut that you make here. I don't think it's necessary to this extent. So it's a D natural. And, and 
then it would build up more naturally. I think, don't, don't make these cuts, perhaps. Um, I mean, those, yes, the eight notes. Yeah. More legato violins. And now, stretch. From here, I, I think that here I want you to stretch the rests more, right? So, pa 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 pum, pa 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 pum, beep 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 beep, and then when you restart the theme, right? This is not the recap yet. I mean, this only comes here. He's starting to hint at it, right? Which is already very original at the time, right? Uh, this is a sort of a compositional maneuver, which at the time was very very new to to have elements of the recapitulation. Uh, before the recap actually starts uh, is already interesting. So don't give it away. Try to play it like it's a secret, right? Something that's just starting to sneak up on us. From We don't expect it. We're doing a pop, pop, bum, bum. It's very dramatic. And then it's starting to come back. So keep it pianissimo longer, right? And then you can really peak when you get here and do a long crescendo. So let's start from the forte here. Crescendo. Very nice. Um, this passage, uh, don't speed up too much in the curves, right? Um, there's no question that you can, um, but I think that it should be more operatic, right? And a singer, an opera, especially at the time, could not pull off something as fast as what you do. And I think it's more beautiful if you make every note sing than if you speed up in the corners the way that you do. It's a little too Listian, I think. Uh, so uh, um, try to make it come out of this note here and just sing every note, enjoy it. You know, you can take a little more time and, uh, and, and just Try to think of it as uh, something that somebody is singing rather than a run, you know? Let's do it from here again, so much fun. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's nice. And you can work on that and enjoy every nook and cranny of this run, all the little turns and, and put more expressivity into them. Um, very, very nice, very beautiful. Um, and there, then we get to the recap, um, which is, you know, a lot of the same things. Uh, I'm sure you can apply if you want. We can come to the coda, actually. Let's try this passage. It's, the, it's a long last page, right? With lots of twists and turns. We, it feels like the piece should end here in a way, right? And then he stretches it, stretches it. Uh, so we have to keep it interesting. Um, but let's go from here and, and try to bring out these appoggiaturas as something more of a joke. I think that's a little too fast. Think of Keep it softer, longer in this land. Again, another surprise. That 
was really beautiful. But you see, it's the elements of surprise that I want you to highlight in this last page. It really feels like this should be the last note of the piece. And then we have four more lines of, uh, of imagination and, and, and new ideas and fake endings, you know. And again here, you know, he ends on the third beat and a big gap again and starts piano again. Um, it, it's, it's so imaginative and full of surprises. When you play this line, transfer it to your left hand. Uh, catch the F as a part of the line. Make sure it doesn't cut. And that's really super. Why don't you play the list uh, just, just so I can hear it uh, as a treat? Mm. I'll go sit down. So this is uh, Gnome and Reigen, the second of the two concert etudes. The Dance of the Gnomes, I guess, uh, in English. I feel like there's applause missing when you finish this piece. Uh, we need a crowd. <laughs> this is terrific, eh? Uh, great character, great fun as you play it, and of course, terrific accuracy and uh, technical means it, it doesn't look hard. And it's hard, it's very hard. <laughs> but you don't know that, that's great. <laughs> you don't seem to know that it's hard. Um, I was wondering a couple things about color soft pedal. Do you use the soft pedal at the beginning? Yes. Yes, play it again if you don't mind. Um. Okay, that's great. 
great. Um, see, there, I think that uh, just a little intro. Um, is there any way that you can make it disappear more? Because you, you almost crescendo towards the end of it. You, uh, do a fade out, like a camera disappearing, and then to yep, up, up, up. We have to feel the rhythm in three. Okay, try to resist the temptation to accelerate. Um, your tempo is great, it's super fast, it's virtuosic, but then you push it a little bit and you don't need to because uh, we, part of the fun of the piece is to it needs to dance, right? And if, if, if gnomes are dancing uh, to this, you know, you don't want them to fall over one another. So um, try, try to keep the, this pulse going, it's, it's really fast enough and you don't need to push it. Have you wondered, I, I, I always wonder when I teach this piece, um, about the pedal markings, you know, because you play it rather dry and, and very well. And I also think that's kind of how it sounds good, <laughs> the way that you play it. But Liszt, and he doesn't often take that trouble, really writes a lot of pedal uh, in that first page. Have you ever tried it? Uh, once, and then I didn't do it because it sounded too messy. Yeah, right. It's very different. Let's let's do it just for the the sake of it. Uh, try it from uh, the theme onwards, just so we we hear what it sounds like. sounds terrible uh, <laughs> compared to the way that you usually play it. So why do you think, why on earth would Liszt have written that, do you think? Because um, he thought that as a, maybe his way of playing it or his way of thinking how it's supposed to be played. I think that, um, I think it's because the pianos of his time had a very, very different sound and a very, very different pedal. Uh, Again, uh, even in Liszt's day, uh, even when he wrote this etude, the pianos were very, very different, right? They were much smaller, they had very little sound. Um, if you play on an Erard or a Pleyel, you know, which is the kind of pianos that were uh, uh, kind of in vogue towards the later end of Liszt and Chopin's life, certainly uh, the end of Chopin's life in Liszt middle period, Erard and Pleyel pianos. Um, there are still some around, and I'm sure you'll get a chance to try them. Uh, the action is so, so light. You know you can blow on them and it plays a cluster. <laughs> There's really, um, and, and the sound is rather short-lived, right? Uh, it doesn't sustain as much as these big pianos, and neither does the pedal. The pedal also has a much lighter effect. That's why, you know, in some Beethoven sonatas, he writes these pedals, like in The Tempest and, and The Waldstein, that last for entire lines, and everyone's always scratching their heads. You know, we do it in our day. Even Haydn does that in some sonatas, some late sonatas. And it sounds so funny on our pianos, because all these wrong harmonies are piled up on top of each other. But in, in their day, on those pianos, the pedal didn't sustain nearly as long, so it didn't blur quite this much. It blurred a little bit, but but not at all to the extent that it does now. And, and I think that's why uh, Liszt has these markings. It just doesn't work on modern pianos. Um, now, uh, in this uh, Giocoso passage, um, you have great character. I think it's a little too left-hand driven. You're not left-handed, are you? No. No, okay. I am. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, it's a problem I'm very familiar with. The left hand always wants to be a little bigger than the right. Um, but this is sort of what I heard through a lot of these sections, um, that I, I, I wanted to hear more of the... And, and I know you can play it beautifully, but, uh, but this would kind of eat away at it. And, and also, the way you do it, you do a sort of crescendo to the last note with the left hand, and that the more the bar goes, the more the left hand takes over. So try to keep it under the right and listen to all these sixteenths. Yes. Good. 
this is terrific. You see, I mean, it just sounds better, right? Um, now, that softer. I mean, this was, you know, uh, played with rather a lot of energy. Uh, save that for the fortissimo, right? That, when F sharp major at the end, then it's fortissimo. Um, but early in the piece there, it's, it's piano. So just make it seem as though we're starting to see those gnomes, gnomes dancing. I don't know how to pronounce that. In French, we pronounce the G. <laughs> so gnomes, I guess. Um, I mean, you, you know how when we walk in the forest, we always run into gnomes dancing. Uh, <laughs> you just can't avoid them. But <laughs> try, try to imagine that here, we're seeing them in the distance. We're trying to peer through the trees. Oh my God, what's that? Gnomes dancing, mm, weird. <laughs> you know, and then eventually we get closer and closer and it's like we're part of the party at the end, right? But here, try to keep it discreet. So the right hand still above the left, but but piano in the distance, maybe a little more soft pedal. It's nice, it's nice. I'm just wondering uh, what it would be like if you tried the soft pedal. Um, I think it would, uh, one of the great effects that I use the soft pedal for, I think, is generally to cover the left hand. When there's big accompaniments in the left hand, um, I find that it, uh, it really changes uh, the balance. And, and since the problem here is the fact that the repeated chords in the left hand naturally eat up the right hand, uh, I think the soft pedal might help. Uh, let's, let's try. Just put it down for the beginning. I think that's better. You can take it off as you get louder. Great. See, there you started playing the left hand louder, but you caught yourself because you're so smart and quick. Uh, <laughs> but that is exactly it. It's like this bar was too loud, and you were like, oh no. <laughs> you readjusted really well. Great. Um, so, um, yeah, I wasn't sure about the transition here. I think that you can do that a little better. Um, is there a way to restart somewhere on this and try to create a, a, a retardando here that leads a little more naturally rather than stopping at the pium, 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 pium. You know, so it feels like the music continues and, it, and we're still in the same very soft dynamic with better balance. In the head. That's, it, that's the idea. So it slows down, but doesn't stop. too fast. Uh, see there uh, with the 30 seconds, uh, sometimes, most of the time you play them perfect. But this time, didn't you think that they bunch together too much and then we lose some of the clarity? Uh, one thing about clarity, a bit like in the Haydn, is that uh, when we hear every note, it sounds faster, all right? So there, now it started to sound like a Clusters almost rather than tiggy, 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 tiggy. so make sure that you listen to every note and and it should almost feel slow to you by now because you're so totally uh, dialed into it right um. yes uh, try once more uh, I think your pulse is a little <laughs> driven. Sure. Very 
good. I was gonna suggest that you do something a, a little scary with the swell there. And now you went away and, and did it before I even told you. You can even read my mind now. <laughs> I just give up. Uh, yeah, uh, do it again from here and, and maybe a little more swell there to, to just create a sort of um, before we get back to a sharp minor. It's a great modulation, right? Uh, we're in G minor and then oh, F sharp minor again. Terrific. Um, what do you think of the balance there? It's a little bit off. It's a little bit, a little bit off. The, the left hand really eats up uh, the right there. Uh, and I think it's probably a function of the piano a little bit. Uh, it must be a little more powerful in the middle register. Um, I will not sit down and try to play this because I've never played it. Uh, but, um, but I mean, what if you uh, tried to pay special attention to that now uh, and tried it again? This is when we finally are in the fortissimo, right? So this is where you finally get to play it super loud. But, but try to keep that in mind, you know, listen to the right hand, listen for the tune and try to obliterate the chords. <laughs> I always find this passage uh, usually very joyful. Uh, I find like it's the arrival of the piece. This is where we're going to. Um, as well as you play this, I don't feel that as much uh, when you get here. Perhaps it's a function of the pedal or, you know, see, there he writes these long, bar long pedals. And I think it works a little better um, if you were to pedal more there to change the sound, to show that it's a different place in the piece, right? And, I really think I, I would like to hear more of the right hand there. It, it's, it's a little too bunched up again, right? It's like the 16s go too fast and we can't really make them out. And, and I think that works great in there, but when you get here, I would like you to think of the right hand more as a melody because it, it is beautifully uh, written, right? And it's more Chopin-esque in a way, right? This is very Listian, it's very virtuosic, very uh, dramatic, but this here becomes uh, very singing, right? With all these beautiful turns, do it slowly once and try to... Do it slower. Uh, and try to find the music, that's what I mean. That's right. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that when you play it fast, you lose that a little bit, right? So practice it slow like that. And then when you speed it up again, you will keep some of this beautiful music that you are putting now in the twists and turns. Do you want to try it fast and, and see if you can have a little more sing song going? Yeah, make that, that especially very elegant, right? That's right. Don't rush too much there, because uh, again, it bunches up and it doesn't sound as uh, virtuosic in a way. <laughs> Try to make these chords disappear, right? So uh, make it a shape, pa 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 pa. 
and not ta 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 ta, you know, ta 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 ta, always in a sort of diminuendo in a group like this. <laughs> Yes. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Just disappear. Great. That's great. Um, well, it's really, really a pleasure to meet you and hear you, and uh, I so look forward to hearing more great things from you in the future, and I'm sure more will be coming, so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you.